Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. I'm your host again today, James Finkbeiner. Don't worry, Corey will be back next week. Today on the show, we have Robbie Picard from Oil Sand Strong and Oil and Gas World Magazine. But before we get to Robbie, let's talk about Canada's oil and gas industry a little bit. I grew up in an oil field family. While most teens' after school jobs were in fast food or working in retail, I spent my days washing winch tractors and cleaning well site trailers. By 15, I was a half decent uh, swamper. I could often be found helping move drilling rigs and tank farms on the Suffield block. The industry was good to me and my family. I watched in awe as my dad built up several successful companies, not only supporting his own family, but hundreds across the province. But our story is hardly unique. There are hundreds of small service companies across the West. They move rigs, rent equipment, frack, and drill. And more than that, they support their communities. You'd be hard-pressed to walk into a hockey or curling rink and not see a sign thanking a local oil and gas entrepreneur for supporting the facility and the teams that play within it. Oil and gas is more than just an industry. It's a way of life. It's not for the faint of heart to spend weeks and sometimes months at an isolated drilling and mining location, away from friends, family, working in the bitter cold in the winter months and trying to stay cool in the hot summer sun. This is all too overlooked by the Eastern elite who seek to shut down the lifeblood of the Western Canadian economy. When they say, leave it in the ground, these aren't shots at Alberta, Saskatchewan's government. No, they're shots at the everyday Canadians that work hard to put food on their tables, raise their kids right, and build a comfortable retirement. The demand for oil will peak one day, but that day won't be anytime soon. There's hardly a facet of our modern lives that doesn't require a petroleum product in some form. The environmentalists scream that we're killing the planet, but the truth is Canadian oil and gas is the cleanest petroleum industry on earth. If the world needs oil, why shouldn't it be Canadian oil? From emission caps to carbon taxes, no more pipelines and tanker bans, the federal liberal government in Ottawa has put roadblocks and barriers in the way of the West's most vital industry. But still, the industry thrives. <clears throat> Hit, uh, still, the industry thrives, hitting an all-time production high in 2023. And more than that, we're doing it cleaner than we ever have. In 2022, the industry cleaned up over 8,000 oil leases, busting the myth that Alberta doesn't care about the environment. At the same time, we have reduced methane emissions 45% since 2014, three full years ahead of schedule. Just like it took Alberta Innovation to get the oil out of the ground, Alberta Innovation is making it cleaner and more responsible. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith says she'd like to take a page out of the American's book by becoming the world's largest oil and gas producer while simultaneously reducing emissions. As the Western Standard Sean's Polzer tells it, south of the border, lower 48 production has undergone a miracle transformation nearly tripling from about 4.5 million barrels per day in 2010 to an all-time record of 13 million barrels per day in 2023. According to the Energy Information Agency, no country on Earth has ever produced that much oil since it was first discovered in 1857. Meanwhile, U.S. CO2 emissions in absolute terms have fallen a minimum of 25% since 2007, even as oil and gas production have reached new heights. Smith says the American experience can be replicated here in Alberta as well. Well, I agree with the Premier. We can and we will do it here. We have all the tools at our disposal. Engineers, scientists, and geologists working around the clock to extract our resources in the cleanest way they can. For now, it's clear the Liberal and NDP coalition aims to shut down the industry. We can only hope that a change in Ottawa will get the federal government out of the industry's way and instead get behind it. Now, let's check in on the news with Dave. Dave, what do you got for us today? Oh, James, as usual, lots and lots of stuff. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. When's Corey back? Uh, Corey's back next Wednesday. Oh, wow. I wonder if he's bringing his gifts. I hope so. Uh, he's been he's been down uh, down in the states where it's been warm. So uh, he's pretty close to Mexico, I think. So I'm I'm hoping for a bottle of tequila. Well, you know what? It was 15 Celsius in Calgary yesterday, so uh, I'm not feeling overly jealous of them. That's for sure. Uh, that's true. It's uh, it's been nice now that uh, the deep freeze is, is over with. Exactly. 
So as mentioned, we got lots of stuff uh, on the site at the moment, James, leading off with uh, a column from Linda Slobodian on that uh, the UN uh, fundraising or the UN group uh, that's been linked with Hamas and why it's taken uh, Canada so long to uh, stop funding to it. Uh, today, uh, they're being launched across Alberta. Uh, Environment Minister Rebecca Schultz is calling them historic talks uh, on uh, water supply. Uh, we're headed for what appears to be a major drought in the summer. And uh, we're, she started talks on uh, water sharing with all the big uh, water lease holders in the province. Uh, everybody's favorite uh, CBC uh, president, uh, Catherine Tate, was in Ottawa yesterday by appearing before a committee and uh, quite laughably said that, uh, you know, it's up to CBC to stop all the disinformation uh, that's uh, happening out in the country. So when we fell off our chairs laughing, we got back up and put a story on that. Oh, she's also going to keep her uh, $100,000 bonus, uh, uh, James, in case you were worried about that. Uh, we've got lots of fallout on the uh, City of Calgary single-use uh, plastic bylaw, the uh, the bag ban. Uh, uh, Michelle Rempel Garner, the MP for Calgary Nose Hill, presented a uh, petition of 4,000 people uh, today uh, from uh, Calgary Co-op demanding that their compostable bag uh, be allowed to be used. And uh, the Prime Minister sniffed his nose at that and, uh, and uh, said, uh, move on. And we've got a story on the city of Saskatoon. They're being mocked by the Canadian uh, Taxpayers Federation for spending $100,000 of taxpayers' money talking to citizens about cycling. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's quite springtime in Saskatoon yet, even though the weather may be uh, a bit nicer, James. But uh, you know what these governments can find to spend taxpayers' money on is really quite mind-boggling. It, it, it's out of control. I, it, it's... $100,000 to talk about cycling. Uh, that's that's like Medicine Hat spending $300,000 to work with a group to tell them how to better build their city, except they're not actually going to tell them how to build the city. Yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, uh, you know, Saskatoon is a typical Canadian uh, winter city, and there's not a lot of cycling going on in the winter months. But, uh, hey, let's spend some money and talk about it. Well, and I don't understand why they need to spend $100,000 when they can just copy Calgary and Edmonton's homework. We've already done this here. We've got bike lanes all over the city now. I think Calgary has one of the most extensive bike networks in North America. What do they need all of that cash to, to have, a, a, you know, what essentially amounts to a town hall? Yeah, and I think you were tweeting last week or something that uh, you were going to be, uh, what, uh, riding, or driving your car on bike lanes because they're the only things that get plowed in the city? Uh, I was actually just going to walk down the bike lanes because for about three days after that last snowfall, we had absolutely no sidewalks cleared, but the bike lanes were absolutely immaculate. Uh, there was actually quite a few of us that decided the sidewalk was a little slippery and uh, decided decided to use the sidewalk. Even on Monday, I fell on my own sidewalk and it's ice's fault. Uh, I have shoveled my sidewalk. My snow is clear, but uh, it, it's it's really frustrating when you see what the city's priorities are when the bike lanes are immaculate but the roads haven't been plowed and the sidewalks are dangerous yeah and that one person cycles by you yep well thanks for uh updating us dave make sure everybody checks out uh westernstandard.news for all of our content we've got uh, reporters working all the time trying to get up as much stuff as they can uh keep you informed remember if uh, you're not already a western standard member you can subscribe at westernstandard.news slash subscription thanks dave thanks james well, unfortunately, my guest has a flat tire, so you're stuck with me for 10 minutes on my own. Uh, but I want to touch base on uh, on this plastics ban situation. Last week, we uh, brought you the war on lunch, and we, uh, we broke down Calgary's new uh, single-use plastic ban, uh, the bag bylaw, uh, the bag tax, as the Canadian Taxpayer Federation called it. What's happened now in the last week is the city councillors have actually heard from their constituents and a couple of them have changed their minds. I really actually commend city council for taking this step. Uh, right now, Canadians are facing an incredible affordability problem. Uh, you know, groceries have gone up and up and up. The cost to heat your homes have gone up thanks to the carbon tax or the tax on everything. And this is just one more thing. And I'm not saying that we don't need to change our habits and, and we can use less. 
We don't always need 50 ketchup packages every time we order. But, you know, the restaurants and the customers need to have that conversation between themselves. Charging a tax for a bag isn't going to reduce the waste. Instead, trying to change people's attitudes and behaviors. Instead, say, hey, you know what? I don't need this ketchup today. I'm going to return this ketchup. Or simply ask, I don't need a fork. I don't need a knife. I've got my own. But instead, they've always decided to be authoritarian and, and come at us and say, no, you absolutely cannot uh, do things this way anymore. What's even more frustrating is the bags that they're taxing are compostable. We already pay for our compost. Uh, you know, it's, it's frustrating when, uh, when you look at your utility bill every month and at the bottom of the bill, you have a charge for uh, compost, waste recycling, and uh, the landfill, but then you have to pay for uh, the compostable bags that you're putting into the system. I am really glad that Calgary has uh, changed course on this, but it'll be fascinating to see. It, so far, Edmonton hasn't, and I don't believe Banff has either. So it'll be fun to compare the two cities a little bit further down the road and uh, see how, how, um, how the changes actually worked, if there actually is an increase in waste in Calgary and Edmonton, and if there's, uh, you know, not... Uh, not in Edmonton, or uh, see if there's more waste in Calgary and less waste in Edmonton. <clears throat> but just uh, taking a look here at the comments as well. Uh, I seen this one earlier. I hear all tell about heaven in Alberta where they've got all hell for a basement. That, uh, yeah, Big Sugar. Uh, it's an excellent song. It's about my hometown, Medicine Hat. Uh, Rudyard Klip Kipling was the one who uh, made that comment. And it's just, you know, we have unlimited oil and gas well we have limited oil and gas resources but in, in medicine hat it was so shallow that people used to go out into their backyards and dig their own natural gas wells uh, of course that resulted in some explosions and a couple of other problems but you know the other thing that people forget about medicine hat in the area is there's just an absolute ton of coal in that area as well so you can actually still go travel around and check out certain areas in old closed coal mines, but you'll actually see the coal seams are on fire. And the coal seams have been on fire since a lot of those mines were shut down. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of awesome when you get out and get to travel around the province and see how uh, our oil and gas and coal and our resource injuries, industries have actually shaped the province um, and, and shaped the communities, you know. Um, Medicine Hat, it's called the Gas City. And then you've got uh, other areas like Grand Prairie and Fort McMurray where they've got the oil sands and oil. And, you know, we've really built our, our province around that industry. And it's it's an important industry. It's um, <clears throat> not only is it is it pumping the public coffers full of money and keeping our taxes low, but it's keep, keeping people employed with really, really well-paying jobs. And a lot of people are jealous of the wages that the oil and gas workers make. But like I said earlier, how much money would it take for you to be away from your family for two, three, four weeks at a time and live in, and I used to rent out camps, so I, I can trash them a little bit, but the, the camps are, you know, not much better than prisons. And, you know, it, it, the wages have to match that or nobody would do it. And these people work hard. Like Most shifts are 10 to 12 hours a day minimum. So you're away from your family. You're working 10, 12 hours a day. And, and you know, you're, you're paid uh, for that work. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's frustrating to see that the liberals, instead of getting behind the industry and pushing for more creative resource development and cleaner resource development and, and less emissions, uh, methane is one of the things that drives me crazy because methane is actually useful. And for years, we just flared it. Well, there's some great innovators. Uh, uh, one company here in Calgary, Highwood Emissions um, Management, has been working on ways to reduce these emissions and reuse these emissions and uh, really help grow the clean energy industry alongside of the oil and gas industry, finding ways that they can use synergies to better um, better produce oil and gas. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm hoping to talk about this with Robbie here in a little bit, um, the, the social aspects of the Canadian oil and gas field. Um, Canadian oil and gas is the most ethically produced oil and gas on the planet. We have the highest environmental standards, but not only that, we have the highest social standards in the world. You're not going to go to Saudi Arabia 
and see a ton of women working in the industry. And you're definitely not going to see anybody from the LGBT community working in the industry, at least not openly. And then we have the pipelines and pipelines management and how pipelines are built and used. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline will be the safest pipeline in the world when it's completed and, uh, and goes live here soon. That pipeline is uh, it's, it's built with special reinforcements. And even uh, through the Burnaby Mountains, they, they basically encased it in, in concrete. And, you know, we've seen in the past uh, oil spills, and, and we don't want that. But if you compare us to the rest of the world, we're the only ones tracking those oil spills, cleaning up those oil spill, spills, and, uh, you know, making sure that we not only extract the resources, but we extract the resources um responsibly uh the the other thing with alberta's or with canada's oil and gas industry is that it, it's not some faceless industry ran by big oil ol oligarchs the large majority of canada's oil and gas industry is small service companies uh hundreds of rig moving companies well dozens of rig moving companies but hundreds of rental companies and uh, service supply companies, little pipeline companies that connect each individual well into the larger pipeline system. But there's also the electricians that connect the oil and gas um, wells to permanent power and, uh, you know, build the compressor stations and, and everything. There's so many different areas uh, from upstream, downstream, midstream, and every single one of these contributes to the Canadian economy. And I would hate to see what the Canadian economy looks like right now without the oil and gas industry. Uh, we would be in a technical recession or, or in a real recession. <clears throat> and it would be more beneficial if the federal government could find ways to help encourage the oil and gas industry to be more creative and really push hard on, um, on, on different ways to uh, you know, produce more oil and reduce emissions like the Premier is looking for. You know, the uh, United States has become the world's largest oil and gas producer in the world, and they don't have the reserves that we do. So if we could get our pipelines to Tidewater, both in BC and out east, you know, we could help um, reduce the global emissions by getting our natural gas to India and China. And, and you know, if, if we're going to push for um, any our, uh, carbon neutral societies, and if we're now going to... Um, uh, um, lower emissions globally, the fastest way to do that is to help countries um, with emerging economies reach those goals as well. Um, you know, you've got different countries in Africa and the, the wealthier they get by developing their own resources, the more power they're going to consume. And we can, we can use solar, we can use wind, we can use uh, geothermal, we can use all of these things combined. But last time I checked, you need oil to build a solar panel. It requires oil to build a wind turbine. And all of these things have mechanical parts in them that need oil and gas products. And there's no reason why these products can't come from Canada, especially when we're leading the world on doing this properly. And yes, we've seen quite a few foreign oil companies leave the country, um, especially after the uh, No More Pipelines bill came in. But, you know, we're working hard to bring those companies back and we're working hard to expand the industry for jobs and for, you know, the, the longevity of, uh, of Canada, but the, the longevity of Alberta as well. <clears throat> so I uh, just hoping here that, uh, that our guest can get in. He's uh, just sent me another message that he's got a flat tire. So uh, while we're waiting, I'm just going to take a quick peek at uh, the site and see what else is coming up. Um, so this is another thing that's been happening in Alberta is the, uh, water shortages. Uh, so last week in, or this week in Edmonton, there was a pump that went down and Edmonton was put on water restrictions. And it looks like now, um, that the federal go or the provincial government is trying to get out in front of, uh, the water shortages that could be coming this spring. You know, we had a uh, historic, um, snowpack in the mountains a few years ago. And, uh, since then, um, you know, our reservoirs haven't been filled. And with the reservoirs not being filled properly, we uh, are going to be running into a bit of a situation this year with, um, with drought and with irrigation and even with recreation. And this is going to affect a lot of things. So this is, this is another thing that even ties back into oil and gas. 
Canadians have been uh, finding ways to reduce the amount of fresh water our oil and gas uses more than anywhere else in the world. Uh, most of our fracking, if not all of it, is done using recycled water and recycled products. And, and that's a huge change from using fresh water for everything. And I think that's something that should be highlighted and pointed out, especially going into uh, this summer, where we're going to have um, uh, we're going to have this uh, this drought situation across the province. Uh, you know, it's really good that uh, Environment Minister Rebecca Schultz is getting out in front of this now and working with stakeholders, irrigation districts, uh, landowners to to make sure that we've got enough water. Um, uh, this spring, but, uh, you know, for sure, this is something we're going to have to keep our eye on. And I hope that we can figure, uh, figure this out because we don't want years and years and years of water shortages going across the country. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm just checking here and nope, still no guests. So we're, uh, <sighs> We're struggling. That's what. Uh, uh, so let's let's reflect on last week. Last week, last Wednesday, it was uh, Tucker Carlson Day. Uh, Tucker Carlson spoke in both Calgary and Edmonton, and uh, it uh, well, the Liberals lit their hair on fire about it. Uh, you know, Danielle Smith, the Premier of Alberta, made a, a, a remark that she wished Tucker Carlson would put Stephen Gilbo in his, in his crosshairs, and you know, Stephen Gilbo. Uh, he he uh, took that as a personal attack, saying that this would raise violence against um, politicians. And, you know, that's just not true. And, and it's just disingenuous, especially coming from Minister Gilbo, uh, when, you know, he climbed on top of former Premier Ralph Klein's house and uh, was attempting to install solar panels while his terrified wife was in the house alone. You know, it's a little bit rich coming from a guy who's actually done something against a politician to say that this is going to cause hate against him. And uh, one of the other uh, ministers, uh, Randy Bassanel from Edmonton, he went on some sort of unhinged rant about conjuring the evil mega forces from the United States. I don't even know what that means. Minister, like, th th come on. A and then to follow it up by saying that uh, she invited... Uh, the homophobic rantings of a mega madman, it, it, it just doesn't hold any water. It's completely disingenuous. I went back and I actually watched Tucker's speech in both Calgary and Edmonton. And if the line for homophobia is calling Justin Trudeau a cross-dresser, then we really have some problems with our society. If you take a look, Justin Trudeau's never had a problem putting a costume on <clears throat> and uh, just absolutely making a fool out of himself and making a fool out of Canada. So I, I, uh, I, I would say to, to both ministers, I would say, get a grip, uh, you know, check on the site. Our opinion editor, Nigel Hannaford has an excellent article up, uh, time to grow a spine. And, and that's true. You know what, if, uh, you don't want to go into politics and get called out for the decisions and your policies and how you feel, just don't go into politics. You know, it's, uh, it's not a game for the faint of heart. And, and, more than doing uh, or telling people what they should be doing and how they should live their lives, politicians should be seeking to actually, you know, govern where the way that their constituents want them to govern. They, um, you know, they're, they're supposed to listen to their constituents and come up with policy that their constituents can vote for and get behind and, and that they support. And instead, most of the liberals in the NDP coalition looks down its nose at uh, Alberta politics or at um, at their constituents and tells us what we need, and, and it's frustrating. It's uh, it's not how our country should be ran, and uh, it, it's just you know um, it's 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 sad. Um, so you know, I I, uh, I watched Tucker's speech, and you know, there was a lot of important things in there, and one of the most important things I think he said was, you know, maybe it's time to start laughing at uh, the ridiculous things that these people are saying. And, and he's right. You know, when, uh, when, when um, churches are burning across the country and when, um, you know, they're trying to shut down our major industry and their response is, you're racist, it's, well, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. And, and race has absolutely nothing to do with it. And, you know, they say that they're, the, the right is pushing far-right conspiracy theories I don't even know what that means anymore. Which conspiracy theories? 
um, you know, because they used unconstitutional laws to shut down protests. And, and if you look, these protests, especially convoys headed out east, these have um, continually been convoys in support of oil and gas, in support of the Alberta and Saskatchewan economies, in support of responsible resource development across the world. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's laughable at this point that they, uh, <laughs> they uh, just keep shutting things down and, and, and you know, it's 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 unnecessary and then to come out and, and to say that they're outraged and that this is going to cause violence it's just ridiculously disingenuous and and it's it's not uh it's not how the country should be run uh you know we were pretty excited we uh got two reporters one in calgary and one in edmonton we had a lot of great content up there was a lot of really good discussion from uh, dr peterson tucker carlson um there was uh, Lord Conrad Black in Edmonton and, and the Premier. And, you know, the Premier took a lot of flack saying that uh, Tucker Carlson's not a real journalist, that uh, she shouldn't be meeting with him. Uh, but, you know, if you're a politician, you should take every chance you can to get in front of people and tell them your message. And when the world's eyes are on you because of an event like this, you have the responsibility to get up and explain your position and explain what you're trying to, to accomplish and what your goals are for, for your province. And it's, uh, it's frustrating to see that instead of taking the opportunity to talk to different people from different paths of life, that different groups just came out and said, no, we're gonna, we want to shut this down. We want to shut down free speech. Um, it was, uh, I, I forget which minister it was, but one of the ministers said, or basically alluded that Tucker Carlson should be stopped at the border. Tucker Carlson's not a criminal. He's not been charged with any crime as far as I know. So, <clears throat> why would we prevent uh, ideas from entering the province or entering the country? You know, like th they don't even hear their own dictatorship and their authoritarian words coming out of their mouth. It doesn't even process. Like the, the liberals have invited Hillary Clinton to come speak to them. I don't hear a single conservative saying we should stop her at the border, uh, that she shouldn't be allowed to speak in this country. I'm just looking at the comments here, and uh, one of them says we should get uh, rid of the useless Senate and replace it with direct democracy. Well, you know what? I agree. We we should get rid of the useless Senate. We should definitely seek for Senate reform. Uh, I would love to see uh, the Triple E Senate, you know, equal, elected, and effective. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to see that because the senators that would there would actually have to vote themselves out of out of a job uh you know vote themselves into being elected instead of appointed and uh i just i i can't see them doing it you know they're supposed to be the chamber of sober second thought and you know from the no more pipelines bill to uh the online news act to the online censorship bills and everything else you know the senators have had ample opportunity to shut these things down and they haven't done it and I think that's disappointing. And they, they have constituents that they're supposed to represent as well. But when they're not elected, they're not actually accountable to anyone. And it's, uh, it, it's sad. So I, I hope that someday we'll see a Triple E Senate, but uh, I don't think that'll happen anytime soon. I would, however, really appreciate if uh, the next prime minister would actually appoint the elected senators that Alberta has elected. You know, Alberta is the only province that put this in place. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's better and healthier for democracy if the Alberta citizens actually get to decide who represents them in the Senate instead of the prime minister getting to decide who represents us in the Senate. But it uh, looks like my, my guest is here now, so I can stop uh, floundering all over the place. And uh, let me just get to, uh, to his bio here. So a lot of you guys are already going to know Robbie Picard. Uh, he has been taking on Neil Young, Jane Fonda, and most recently drove across the country to tell the story of the oil and gas industry. Uh, Robbie's an advocate, businessman, and a serial entrepreneur. Thank you for joining me today, Robbie. Hi, thank you. And I uh, apolo apologize for being late. I had a flat at the worst possible time, uh, but uh, thank you very much for having me on your show. No worries. That's always the way it goes, though. Uh, you're, you're never, when, whenever you, uh, you have an appointment or something you can't miss, that's normally when stuff like that happens. And, uh, Corey's a little bit better at this than I am. He's had practice with guests that are late. 
Uh, I do not. So I apologize to the Western Standard members. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm actually, I'm a huge fan of your work. Obviously, from being in the oil and gas industry, I appreciate the advocacy that you've done for our jobs and for our industry. But uh, for the people who don't know who you are or who's watching, who, who is Robbie Picard? Oh boy. Um, I guess I am a, I'm a local business guy, but I in 2013, 2014, I kind of I had an interesting experience. I was at the airport and I was with my friend Cindy and um, I noticed this like, like this jet land at her airport. And, it, and it, I'm like, and I looked at her, I was walking my dogs and I said, wow, whoever has that jet has a lot of cash. And that was the time that Leonardo DiCaprio came to Fort McMurray um, to kind of bash us. And I thought, wow, how hypocritical is that, that you, know, you can afford this jet? And you come to the community that, uh, you know, contributes so much to the economy of Canada and you, you fly a private jet here and then come and slam us. I guess that was almost two years ago. So I guess I'm an old sounds activist. Um, I have a marketing company. Um, I've got a new magazine called Oil and Gas World. Um, and uh, I believe in getting the other message out there. I really hate the world we're in right now with this wokeness and this such polarization and I don't like it how my community here in Fort McMurray has been so viciously attacked over and over again in regards to the very thing that pays their bills. Um, I believe we have the highest environmental standards in the world. We do reclamation. Um, it's economic reconciliation for Indigenous people. Um, so I guess in a nutshell, I'm a marketing guy that is a big believer in Alberta and um, Canadian energy and Canada's oil and gas. Yeah, that's quite the resume. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about Oil Sand Strong. What what uh, what does Oil Sand Strong do? We um, advocate, um, so I, I guess I wear two hats. I got Oil and Gas World Magazine, which is more of a humanizing thing, uh, where we talk to people, interview them, and find out about pe families in oil and gas and what they do. And then Oil Sand Strong is like, it's the group that we stand up, we've got just shy of 300,000 followers on Facebook and our reach is always in the millions and it's pretty strong. And uh, we take on celebrities. So a few years ago and in, uh, in a very cold January, uh, Jane Fonda came to Fort McMurray. We confronted her, we called her out and then uh, she ended up leaving. Um, we've taken on celebrities like Jan Arden, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. So we, we advocate for, Canada's oil and gas industry, particularly the oil sands here, um, and we, we're we not scared to get the other message out there or combat the, the sheer hypocrisy of the world we're in right now. Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. I, uh, I I actually love your video of you confronting Jane Fonda. Uh, you know, that's one of the messages that we all like never, ever hear is that when these celebrities show up and they get in front of a microphone, they're speaking to the world, telling them a different story. And finally, somebody stood up and said, hey, but what about these other stories? You know, what about the indigenous community? What about uh, the people who are working here? What about the families who are just here to put food on their table? And what about the fact that we have the most ethically, cleanly, and, and progressive society that's producing oil and gas in the world. You know, uh, we should invite Jane Fonda to go on a tour with us to Saudi Arabia, uh, although you and I might want to take some security with us for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the funny part where I found, like, I mean, even recently when I, I saw Randy Bosnoff in Ottawa with Stephen Gabol and they were whining about Tucker Carlson's visit, and I'm gay and, and I'm you know, been openly gay this entire time. And I, I find it hilarious that like that one particular side acts like they speak for all gay people. Like it's real simple. If, if I go to Saudi Arabia and I criticize their oil, I, I'm not just kicked out. I'm dead because I'm gay. They'll cut off my head. They'll throw me off a building or whatever. And um, I also am kind of, we're in a world now where like, I couldn't believe when Tucker Carlson came, I was at that event. I got to meet him and hang out with him a little bit. I couldn't believe the response from the federal government. I mean, they were just so weak. Oh my God, Tucker Carlson hurt our feelings. And oh my God, we, we're not going to stand for this. And it's just like, there's such bigger problems in Canada right now that we are facing that if, if Premier Daniel Smith has a conversation with Tucker Carlson, I mean, it's just insanely ridiculous the world we're in. And uh, I'm, uh, 
I'm happy that the Indigenous and the First Nations, the Métis and the First Nations of Fort McMurray are making amazing deals with oil and gas. They're becoming their own producers. So clearly, Jane Fonda, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Neil Young's visit didn't work. Um, and now that they're getting a bigger piece and understanding that, you know, it, it takes this industry t- lifts people from object poverty. It gives them a purpose. It gives valid uh, validation and resources uh, that they desperately need. And I'm happy to see that, you, that I think generational poverty in my region is starting to just wipe out. And now you're actually getting into the opposite where there's, you know, generational wealth. Uh, and I'm very proud of that and i think that jane fonda and all those celebrities should be ashamed of themselves for what they did to what they did to our region um and the other thing i think we all need to start talking about is like uh, this ban on on, uh, gas and diesel vehicles that is going to happen in in, in 11 years and if we don't like there is no such thing as green energy batteries cause pollution you know even hydroelectricity causes some type of pollution and I just watched a show the other day um, about Manitoba, how their grid is starting to fail and they thought they were the greenest grid ever um, because they've got hydroelectric dams. So I don't know. I think the world needs to wake up and understand there's uh, a lot of problems we're facing and this wokeness of our uh, Mr. Dress Up Prime Minister is really hurting our country. Yeah. So it, let's talk about the grid for a little bit here. So uh, Alberta had to put a, out a grid alert a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we we're importing energy from BC and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan had to fire up an old coal uh, facility in order to make sure that the West's grid didn't collapse. Uh, and we're years away from Site C, if it ever gets finished, from coming online. In, in the short term, we need energy and we need energy now. And we can't rely on... Uh, on wind and solar, what do you think the oil sands and Alberta's oil and gas industry in in general uh, should be to make sure that we, we continue to power the grid and that we actually have safe and secure power? I think there's a couple things. One, we need, uh, we need to stop, like, we all know in Fort McMurray that oil is going to continue. We all know that we're going to probably inc- double our output. It's all there. we got the, tran- the transmitter pipelines firing up here. Um, but the psychological damage that is done on our community with this fake wokeness that they're somehow going to get rid of it really affects the mood up here. And it's funny because, like, we should be booming right now. Like, yeah. oil is at a good price, and there's very little development. A lot of uh, people are scared to, you know, buy homes right now, even though Fort McMurray has the cheapest homes in the country. We have foreclosures like crazy, but um, it's it's a really weird kind of dynamic happening here because right now there should be like come to Fort McMurray, buy a house. You can actually get a house, not like Toronto. You can get a good paying job. But the psychological feeling is that Justin Trudeau has put a time limit on our community and that hurts us now. On the bigger question, like uh, we got rid of all our coal power in Alberta um, and and they switched to natural gas, but getting rid of coal devastated a ton of communities and and they're still recovering from that. So this wokeness that came from the NDP when they did that, um, I am not convinced that there is one answer in regards to power. Um, I know that this so-called green energy in China, every single one of those facilities is backed up by a coal power plant because they're not that reliable. Yeah. So I think we just need to, to stop being ridiculous, stop this war on energy. Look at other ways of dealing with pollution, like planting more trees, uh, wetlands, that type of thing. But when it comes to Canada, real we're 1.5% of all global emissions. We have the biggest forest, the boreal forest, that sucks all of our carbon up. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't understand why we're punishing our energy industry so brutally. I really don't. I mean, either. I, I don't understand why we don't get behind the industry and help it to reduce emissions at, while it continues to grow. Uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still hoping for a day where we see the tech frontier mine, uh, revisited or approved and, and actually get under construction. Now you're Métis. And uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier about uh, like indigenous communities and oil and gas. Uh, my company has actually had benefit agreements with uh, two different nations, and um, th- they're they're amazing. 
uh, there is no better way to get a steady stream of employees that are getting educated, that are getting better, that want to work in the industry, that work hard uh, than these benefit agreements. What kind of uh, effect have these benefit agreements and these partnerships between resource uh, groups, the Indigenous communities had on, on Fort McMurray and uh, the greater, like, greater northern Alberta as a whole? Uh, it, I wouldn't make the argument that we are an example for the entire world on Indigenous reconciliation and economic reconciliation. I mean, um, a friend of mine, uh, Chief Raymond Powder from the Fort Mackay First Nation, I helped him on his campaign. Um, they have the, I mean, they've got the Fort Mackay group of companies. They employ thousands of people. They, you know, they're doing incredibly well. Um, I'm, you know, connected to a bunch of Métis organizations. Same thing. They've got joint ventures now. They've got companies that do direct working uh, with the oil companies. Um, Infinity Métis group, you know, head by Sean Myers is doing incredible deals right now. Um, Crystal Young was in charge of the business arm of the Fort Mackay Métis. They're doing very well. Uh, it, it's not, there's nothing like this in, uh, I would argue, the entire world. I mean, it's it's amazing. Now, it's not always perfect. I would make the argument that if I was to take a shot at industry, uh, they this consultation should have happened 20 years ago. Um, and then they wouldn't necessarily have had to deal with the negative effects of, you know, celebrity flybys. But, you know... Um, I'm a member of the North uh, Northeast uh, Eastern Aboriginal Business Association. There's over you know 289 members, and no, it's I mean it's, this this city of Fort McMurray, particularly, is game changing. Like it changes people's lives. You can come to Fort McMurray with nothing and get a job, and then before you know it, you own a home and you have a purpose. Um, if you have a business, uh, it, it, I'm I I think like they're doing the worst thing the federal government is doing is is it hurts our i mean not to be weak or anything but it hurts our collective consciousness it affects our self-esteem when you have you know your federal government you know attacking your source of income so much that changes everyone's lives i mean i i cannot tell you the amount of people from the east coast that i know who you know were say working in the fisheries and lost their job or whatever and then they came here and now they're retiring back in newfoundland they're buying two properties and, and they've got tons of money so i mean it's it's game changing and then you know the worst part is when you when you see like quebec get transfer payments after transfer payments and it all comes from here you know it's kind of demoralizing so kind of to your question um yeah, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to Indigenous people. And I, I only see more success. I see uh, Indigenous people becoming oil producers. I think that's the next step. You're going to see a lot of Indigenous-owned oil companies. Yep. So, I mean, it's good. And the rest of the country should learn from it. Oh, exactly. Like uh, the, the oil and gas tide rises all boats. And just the, the spinoff to the economy, the, the tax generation, the resource revenue, the homes like income taxes it just it's exponential how much it actually helps these communities and, and you know it, it's kind of rich for quebec to say there's no social license for pipelines or oil and gas exploration in quebec at the same time uh you know importing oil and gas from some of the worst dictatorships on on the entire planet while basically treating alberta which is one of the most progressive places even with conservative governments, we're still one of the most progressive places on earth. Um, you know, the, but the, they're fine with dictator oil. But yeah. uh, just before we wrap up here, Oil and Gas World Magazine, <laughs> tell me about this new project of yours. Um, okay, so it has become uh, an amazing project. It's like, it's, it's, it, I love it. Um, we're on our fifth issue now and they're gonna be coming up monthly. It's been a bit hard to get together. It's not easy. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to find a way to like oil sand strong is kind of the fist, right? Like we're, we're, we go after people, we, we defend our industry, but there's a lot of people that are in the oil and gas industry that I find are very interesting. They've got hobbies and they are different and they, they there's a soul to them. They're not just these like kind of like tough oil people. So I, I started this project to travel across the country and interview people from all walks of life. So rather if I'm interviewing, say, say someone of Brett Wilson's, you know, like kind of a multi-millionaire, billionaire guy in his business, or uh, a friend just has a, like a little a gas station restaurant, 
I, I try to talk to them and hear their stories. And, you know, we always try to connect it to something to do with oil and gas, but that doesn't necessarily have to be. And the response has been amazing. And I, I find myself just love doing these interviews and um, kind of we have the written component. Um, it's uh, it, it's on our website, oilandgasworld.ca. And then all the interviews are done digitally. We film them ahead of time. We do the editing and then we do the the, the print version like this, where we put all uh, all the stories in print. And what I find is the vast majority of people that I've talked to from coast to coast, they want a strong energy, uh, they want pipelines, they want a strong natural gas, um, oil sands, they want they want that. And the wokeness of the federal government right now has tried to take that message and hijack that message. And I don't believe I believe the vast majority of Canada, Canadians want all kinds of energy. And no one wants to be forced to drive an electric car. So I love what the, the project's doing really well. I originally wasn't actually even going to do print, um, but I did a print one to kind of show the idea. And then it just took off and everybody wanted a copy of the print one. So we print them. They're available at all the Canadian brew houses uh, across Canada um, and a few other places as well. And uh, and then if, if people can't get a, the copy, we just click the QR code. They can download on their phone and they can watch the videos as well. But yeah, it's been an awesome project, and I'm, I'm I'm thrilled to be doing it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's awesome. I'm really excited about this project as well. Uh, you you and I got to chat a little bit last week, and uh, I think one of the biggest things and one of the biggest misconceptions of the oil and gas industry is that it's like six billionaires that are sitting around smoking cigars and pipes in downtown Calgary when realistically it's hundreds if not thousands of small businesses small entrepreneurs small families and, and people working working in this industry thank you very much for joining me though uh, you you already said your oil and gas world uh, what's that website again oil and gas world.ca oil and gas world.ca you can check out uh, Robbie's project there and uh, you can also check out uh, what's the oil sand strong website oilsandstrong.com oilsandstrong.com you can uh, find Robbie and more information about him and his work there thank you very much for joining me today awesome a pleasure being on your show and apologize about being late <laughs> no worries we all have flat tires okay thank you thanks well before we go today, I just want to touch on one thing. It sounds like there's going to be an announcement about a parental rights bill here in Alberta, uh, either today or tomorrow. And uh, I, I just want to touch on it just briefly before we go. Uh, you know, this is a very emotional topic. It, it's complicated and it's been over-politicized for far too long. Uh, you know, one side says that the other side's homophobic and that they're attacking the rights of gay kids and trans youth. And it, that's just not true. So I hope that when these uh, new policies come out in the next 24, 48 hours, that everybody can take it and approach it from a human point of view. Uh, you know, consider that that's someone's kid that we're talking about. Consider that it's someone's parent, that it's their friend, that it's their family member, and that these measures aren't coming out to punish anybody or try to shut down or silence a particular community. These policies are coming out to protect kids to ensure parents have rights and, and to ensure that we have a society where everyone is supported, uplifted, and loved. With that, we're going to end today's show. And uh, next week, Corey will be back and uh, we can all go back to normal. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. If you're not already a member of the Western Standard, you can become a member, www.westernstandard.news slash subscribe. Thanks. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. You become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny.